Hey, future respiratory therapist. So it's kind of a hot topic right now, and it kind of intrigues me on why it's such a hot topic. It's kind of creating a lot of uh, polarization between incoming future respiratory therapists that are yet to take their board exams and the therapists out there that have already taken their, their board exams and passed it. And the question comes from Katie from Weatherford College. Uh, appreciate the question, Katie. I know you've been asking for this shout out for a long time, and this one's for you, okay? So Katie wants to know what my thoughts are on allowing the calculator to be used, the simple calculator that's going to be on the computer, to now, starting in 2020, to be used during the MBRC exam, where previously no calculators were allowed. You had to use uh, scratch paper and, and, and basically write it out if you wanted to, if you needed to calculate something. And my answer to you, Katie, and to everybody else watching this video is, is that I'm indifferent. You know, I really am. I'm not one of these I already passed my board exams and I couldn't use a calculator, so why do you get to use a calculator? Like, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. What I'm more focused on and 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 what I really care about, and really what happens here is here's here's the concerns of my students. They say, Oh, well now the calculator is gonna be on a test, so is the test going to get harder? Well I don't I, I well first of all I don't know the answer to that. Uh, is the test going to be more focused on actually calculating numbers and getting the correct number as opposed to a greater just cognitive understanding of what formulas tell us? Now, there's a lot of formulas in respiratory therapists. The person who gets into respiratory therapy because they say, oh, it's just breathing, so it can't be that much math, is, is your first mistake, right? So as you know, for those of you currently in school, there's a ton of formulas in the field of respiratory therapy. And the key here, and what I think is most important is, is, is not so much, I hope the test doesn't shift to becoming able to get the right answer in terms of, of here's some data, what's the patient's total O2 content? What's their, what's their carrying capacity? Like that, I hope it doesn't turn into that. Because if it turns into that, then I think a bigger focus is going to shift on being able to get the right answer instead of understanding what that particular formula tells us about our patient. And that's the key. The key in the formulas of respiratory therapy, and I harp on my students all the time about this, is not understanding so much how. If you don't know how because you suck at math, don't worry. You can Google enough and you can practice enough to learn how to get the right answer. The bigger problem is, is when you miss a formula that is relevant to your patient and you miss it because you don't even know to do it. That's the bigger problem. The bigger problem is, is not recognizing why this number, this objective data is important to me in taking care of this patient. The calculator is not going on the test. The calculator now available on the test is not going to address that issue. It'll help with getting the right answer when, when asked or questioned about a particular number, but, but it will not address the theory behind and the why are we calculating certain formulas. So I got a handful of examples for you. Okay, now this is going to seem like, okay, well, how many more examples? You can give? I'm going to give you five examples of formulas and formulas that you probably need a calculator for in most cases, but why the number is not as important as the theory. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to start with, um, let's start with the RSBI. Okay, this is the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index. So RSBI we know is frequency divided by tidal volume. And this has got to be in liters. See, that's another part. If you, if you, don't, if, if you don't understand the entire formula, then you're going to get the wrong answer anyways with a calculator. So you understand that you're dividing frequency, which I like to use respiratory rate, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Respiratory rate divided by tidal volume in liters. Now, the first question is, is I have this sometimes. I have patients... I have students that come out and they tell me, they say, hey, Joe, my patient's RSBI is really good. What is it? It's 30. Okay. Why? Is that good or bad? That's good. What's normal? Less than 105. Okay. Okay. Now, let's go in and look at the patient now. We go in and look at the patient. The patient's on assist control. No, no, it doesn't even matter if they're breathing spontaneously or not or, or, or initiating breaths. They're in assist control, which means their tidal volume is set. And if they're not initiating any breaths, then their respiratory rate is set. So this 
is a formula that doesn't even apply in full mechanical ventilation. It only applies during spontaneous modes of mechanical ventilation in the assessment of weaning. It's a weaning, it's a weaning uh, predictor. A, you know, if you have an RSBI of 150, patient's probably not ready for extubation. You have a, a RSBI of, of 40, then your patient's potentially ready for extubation depending on other factors, right? So you have to understand why am I calculating the rapid shallow breathing index? Because if you don't, then it doesn't matter if you get the right number. Yeah, the guy had an RSBI of 30 in assist control. Doesn't matter. It's not, it's not an applicable formula at this time. So that's, that's my first example when I talk about RSBI. Now the other thing I want to tell you, and this is where the calculator also will not help. And this is where when people say, well, if you can't calculate it, then you don't know what you're doing. What, that, that's arguable, especially when you got students learning all these formulas. So let me give you another example. Day one of a recent clinical rotation, Student went in, did a vent assessment on a patient that was on a mechanical ventilator. They were in CPAP pressure support ventilation. And I went in and I said, how's your patient tolerating CPAP? And the student said, well, it seems to be tolerating it pretty good. And I said, what objective data or what objective number can you give me that supports that the patient's doing eh, pretty good? And this particular student didn't know. The, the RSBI did not come to this particular student's brain in that moment. So I brought it back to him. I said, okay, let's talk about this. What can we do that we can compare this person's frequency of breathing to their depth of breathing? And eventually we get to RSBI. We practice the formula. We show it. We say, okay, this makes sense now. Okay. Now, that's an example of a student who had no idea that they were even supposed to be assessing the RSBI. So it was completely lost. So on the board exams, you're going to probably get the question wrong because you're not even thinking RSBI because you don't even know that that's a valuable tool in assessing a patient who's spontaneously breathing in either PAV or CPAP, pressure support, any other spontaneous breathing modes, right? Now, fast forward two weeks, this particular student has another patient on CPAP, and I go in, and I say, what well, can you tell me about this patient? How are they doing on CPAP? And this student rattles off, they're doing well. Their RSBI is blah, 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 blah. Now, as soon as she said it, I knew that the RSBI was wrong. It was not calculated correctly. But the fact that the wrong numbers were used to calculate the RSBI, does that illustrate less knowledge than the student who actually knew that they were supposed to be calculating the RSBI? Because, see, we can fix that. I can fix the right numbers. I can, I can do that 100%. You go in, you take care of a patient spontaneously breathing, you assess, boom, RSBI. Wrong number, but theory is there. The concept is there. Knowing that I should be understanding this and I should be assessing this value to help, to help evaluate my patient's readiness for extubation. That, to me, is more important than not knowing, or I'm sorry, is more important than, than getting the wrong number. Because with time and with practice, the right numbers will come. But you got to know to do it before you can even practice to get the right number. So that's my first example. Okay. Second example, let's talk about, I used it in my, I, I mentioned uh, total O2 content or carrying capacity earlier. So we're talking about CaO2 here, right? Total O2 content. Now, first of all, you have to understand the formula because do you need a calculator to calculate CaO2 to get the right number? Probably so, right? Formula looks something like this. Hemoglobin times 1.34 times SaO2 plus PaO2 times 0 0.003. That's the formula. Now, can you put numbers in there and get that right answer? Absolutely. Now, if I ask you what that number tells you and what all of this, this, this formula tells you, the question is, can you answer that? Right? Can you tell me that the first portion of this tells me the amount of O2 bound to hemoglobin? And can you tell me that this is the amount dissolved in plasma? 
Can you tell me that? And then, if you can tell me that and you understand that, then you should be able to tell me and understand and critically think and help it make sense that when a patient comes in with a hemoglobin of 6 and a metabolic acidosis, you can reason through this. This makes sense. Instead of you saying, hey, my carrying capacity for my patient, Joe, is, is 10. Okay, good job. Way to calculate it correctly. Now, why is that important? How does that help you understand everything else that's going on? Well, if you can explain to me, well, majority, and they have a stat of 99%. Their PaO2 is 130. Okay, so hemoglobin of 6, but a P little AO2 of 130. And you go, oh, they're oxygenating good. Well, are they? How do we explain the metabolic acidosis? Do you understand that the bulk of this formula is driven by hemoglobin? And if the hemoglobin is down, then your total O2 content reaching the tissues is down. So your patient here is at a high risk for tissue hypoxia, which leads to anaerobic metabolism, which leads to lactic acidosis, which presents as a metabolic acidosis. This makes more sense, right? Can you tie this into the overall patient presentation, regardless if your PaO2 is 130? This patient is by far hypoxic, but they're not hypoxemic. And this formula critically thinking about it, tells me that. Now, again, being able to reason through it like that and you don't need a calculator to do that is more important than me giving you numbers and you get the right answer. And then I say, now, why is that important? What does that tell you about your patient? And you say, I don't know. See? So does a calculator help understand the formula or does it just help get the right answer? I think we know the answer to that, right? All right. So let's talk about this is more or less turning more into a, a more or less turning into a review on formulas as it is much talking about calculators but it really is something that I'm really passionate about is understanding the why is greater than the how you've heard me say that before if you watch any of my videos if this is the first video you're watching then you need to understand that that's my that's my mojo that's that's what I I I I lean on in teaching the field of respiratory therapy I lean on understanding the why greater than the how because if you know the why and you know what you should be thinking and why you should be doing something then you can google how to do it if you don't know how to, if you don't know how to do it or you can ask somebody how do I do this but if you fail to recognize when something is indicated and why something is important then you don't even know what you should be doing even if you know how to do it so, let's talk about uh, the arterial to end tidal CO2 gradient. So this is important because this gradient is normally very, very close, right? So if I was to act, ask you what's the arterial to end tidal CO2 gradient, and let's say the arterial CO2 was 50 and the end tidal CO2 was 10, then you don't need a calculator to tell me that the gradient equals 40, right? You just don't need it. I mean, hope. I hope you don't need it. 50 minus 10 is 40. If you do need it, you plug those numbers in, you plug them in correctly, and you get the right answer, 40. Now, the bigger question is, why is that important? What does that tell you about your patient? Well, remember, when the gradient gets larger, like this, then it could be an indication of a dead space problem, meaning possible pulmonary embolism. And you take this one step further, and you do the dead space formula, and you perform Paco, Pico, Paco. You plug your numbers in. You get 50 minus 10 equals 40. Divided by 50. And that equals 80%. That tells you that you have an 80% dead space. Which means 80% of your tidal volume that you're delivering to your patient. Or 80% of the tidal volume that the patient is taking. Is not participating in gas exchange because of this ginormous dead space problem. That's more important to understanding than telling me my gradient's 40 and my, my, my dead space percentage is 80%. Fantastic. What does it mean? I don't know. Much more important to understand the why than the how. I got two more for you. 
then we're going to cut this off. I appreciate you watching. Uh, let's talk about PF ratio. A to A difference and the A to A ratio. These are three formulas that I guarantee you every one of you students, if you haven't done it yet or haven't learned it yet, you will, and you will be tested over and you will be asked to calculate these numbers. Now, I think it's fantastic. I think it's good that you know what these numbers tell you and why they're important. But here's the deal, guys. If your PF ratio is decreased, then you should understand without having to calculate anything. Now, obviously, you have to calculate your PF ratio, divide PaO2 divided by FiO2. From there, you should understand that if your PF ratio sucks, then your A to A difference is going to be increased and your A to A ratio is going to be decreased. Why? Because the PF ratio is your indicator of efficiency of oxygenation, meaning of the FiO2 we're putting into this patient's lungs, what's the resulting PaO2? And if it's not good, then you understand that more oxygen, more of the FiO2 you put in is being left in the alveoli, which is this number here. If more is left here and is not diffusing over into here, then this gap is going to get larger. And then when you flip these numbers and do a ratio, this number is going to be larger, this number is going to be smaller, your ratio is going to go down. So yeah, fantastic. Alveolar air equation to get your PaO2. Minus your eight, fantastic. And you know how to calculate them, you know how to get the right answers. Now, what do you do with those right answers and what do they tell you about your patient? They're telling you when you have this scenario that you have a shunt present. You've got venous admixture that's diluting your arterial oxygenation and this giant shunt is affecting diffusion of the FiO2 you're putting into your patient. That's the important thing. How are you going to treat this? You're going to turn the FiO2 up? Because if that's your answer, you're just going to make all of this stuff move, but it's all going to stay in the same direction. It's still going to be an increased 8A difference. It's still going to be a decreased 8A ratio. Your PF ratio it's probably going to stay the same because your efficiency of diffusing from the alveoli to the pulmonary capillaries is, is, is obstructed by something. There's a diffusion block. So you can put more FiO2 in there. It's not going to help. What do you need to do? You need to add positive pressure. You need to increase PEEP. You need to increase mean airway pressure. You need to get the, the, the increased surface area so that there's more surface area for the FiO2 that's being delivered to efficiently cross over into the pulmonary capillaries. That's how you have to fix it, and that's how these formulas come into play. Last one, and I'll keep it. I'll try to keep it short. Again, if you've watched any of these videos before, you probably know that this is my favorite formula. This is also what I consider probably the most useful and most basic. This is the formula you have got to know as a respiratory therapist. You have got to understand. You've got to know all of them, but this one is the one that on any given day, you have got to be able to look at your patient and assess minute ventilation and understand what changes are happening in minute ventilation. And you need to understand that minute ventilation is a result of respiratory rate times tidal volume. If respiratory rate goes up, minute ventilation is going to go up. If tidal volume goes up, then minute ventilation goes up. It's just that simple. Now, there's times that this doesn't always fit with what I just said, so I want to give you an example. This is, understanding this is going to help you understand that when you have your patient on CPAP, uh, CPAP of 5 with a pressure support of, of 5, this is going to help you understand that when this patient is breathing 30 times a minute with a tidal volume of 200, they have a minute ventilation of 6 liters. Okay? You say, well, that doesn't look good, right? Well, why not? Because now my RSBI is crappy, right? So what can we do for this patient? We can increase pressure support. We turn the pressure support up to, let's just take it up to 10. Our rate comes down to 20. What's going to happen? When we take our rate up to 10, our tidal volume is going to go up. So let's say it goes up to 300. Well, guess what? Our minute ventilation doesn't go up, it's probably going to stay the same. 
The minute ventilation is what is required to remove CO2 to keep a normal pH balance. The brain knows this. Your, your RT, you as an RT, you know it too, but the patient doing the breathing, their brain is what is in control of minute ventilation based off of pH and CO2. If the tidal volume goes up and they, they're, they're saying that their neural drive to breathe is 6 liters per minute to maintain that normal, that normal uh, CO2 and pH, then you're going to see their rate go down. But your minute ventilation stays the same. That's in spontaneous when a patient is breathing spontaneously. Now, if you're in, if you're in assist control, rate of 12 and a tidal volume of 500, patient's not breathing spontaneously or, or initiating any mechanical breaths, then if your patient comes back with a high CO2, so their, their pH is 7.20 and their CO2 equals 60, then what do you need to do? The most common answer is I need to increase the rate. Okay. Is that the only thing you can do? Some people say, well, no, I can increase the tidal volume. Say, so, okay. So what's really the goal here? What's really, when you think about this formula, and you can calculate it hopefully, and you'll have a calculator in your test, so it'll work for you. Plug your numbers in right, you'll be able to tell the MBRC what the minute ventilation is. But what you need to understand is that in this scenario, this minute ventilation, 12 times 500, is 6 liters. This is, this is liters. What you really should be thinking is, is my minute ventilation is not adequate. It's not where it needs to be. So how do I fix my minute ventilation? Well, I know it's respiratory rate times tidal volume. If I need to get my CO2 down to get my pH back up, then by increasing rate, I will increase minute ventilation. Or if I increase tidal volume, I will increase minute ventilation. And that will help remove CO2 and, and get our pH back up to a range that we like it. Okay, That's just a ex few examples of the way these formulas are more driven towards theory based. And I hope the MBRC, by adding this calculator, which I'm not against, I'm in favor of it, I don't care. I just hope the test doesn't take a route to where the answers become driven on getting the correct number and eliminating everything that we just discussed. Just start talking through five basic formulas. Okay? Katie, I appreciate you asking me for my input on this. Let me know what these conversations are sounding like out there. I would love to hear what, what, what the, 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 the old timers, as we call them, are saying about it not being fair that you get to use the calculator. Look, the knowledge level is in the whys. Remember that. Be able to critically think through the formulas you're doing and apply them to your situation rather than a focus on, good job, you got the right number. Okay, hope everybody's having a great day.